All right. Hello. Is it working? Yes, it is. Hurrah. Excellent. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming along to the Squirrel Squadron, coming along to talk about why you don't need a platform. I'm looking forward to talking to all of you about that. Uh, several of you have weighed in on the Squirrel Squadron forum. Thank you for that. Uh, so I have a few very nice stories from Jez and from Kane. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing those uh, uh, live from uh, from the front lines and uh, happy to talk with you guys about that. Um, while you're coming in, uh, would you mind just uh, po popping something in the chat on whatever platform you're on? Um, I can see it there, uh, LinkedIn and YouTube and uh, Facebook. Um, uh, uh, just stick something in there to say why you're here. What uh, what do you think about having a platform? Are you skeptical on the question of having a platform? Um, do you not know what a platform is? You're wondering whether you should have one, or maybe you have one, you think it's really fantastic, and I'm completely wrong. All of those would be really interesting. Um, just let me know uh, why are you here. And um, those of you who've been before will know that um, uh, the best way that you get the most out of me is to ask me lots of tough questions. So um, I'm looking forward to debate, argument, discussion. Uh, tell me I'm all wet. That would be great. Uh, uh, do that again in the comments. Uh, and I'm very happy to feature those and discuss the topics that are important to you. I've got a few I'm thinking of talking about, but uh, always best if I hear from you guys. Right. So uh, uh, first thing, oh, and by the way, this is all being recorded. So some of you will be watching this as a recording. Your comments I can't look at, but I can talk to you in other ways. So uh, have a look at squirrelsquadron.com, um, uh, douglasquirrel.com as well. You can find my email and, and other places. And of course, there's the Squirrel Squadron forum uh, where I got several of the, the comments that I'll be using here in the, the examples. Uh, the Squirrel Squadron, for anybody who doesn't know, is my community of tech and non-tech people working together. Uh, learning from each other, um, uh, debating and discussing. Uh, we have these events every week. Some of them are closed for execs and are Zoom calls and more interactive. Um, some of them are live streams like this one. And uh, always very happy to interact with you folks. One thing I should highlight, um, because my very uh, helpful community manager, Laura, is watching, she'll kill me if I don't, um, is that we're doing a live event in London on the 8th of September. And that's about saying yes to everything. So uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, and then there's more that uh, is coming later. We're going to be in uh, Berlin or Vienna, I think, in September and Miami uh, in November. So uh, more live activities coming as well, um, plus chances to interact virtually uh, all the time. So if you're interested in any of that, squirrelsquadron.com is the place to go. Uh, oh, and we have uh, uh, upcoming events on uh, giving reprimands and how great they are and uh, testing in live. Forget doing tests um, uh, in, in your staging environment. Just put it live and let your customers test. So all those kinds of things are coming in the, in the squadron soon. We've got a couple people who've commented. Uh, I can't always see people's names and I apologize. It's just the nature of the, the forum. Um, uh, uh, this LinkedIn user would love to de understand the definition of a platform. I'll definitely start there. That's great. Uh, Tim says uh, he thinks he has a platform. He'd like to learn more about how to escape the platform trap. And uh, Simone uh, has some further thoughts. Oh, and Michael's here. Excellent. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, very excellent questions and thoughts. Uh, I will cover all of these as we go through. Good stuff. Um, so let me start by giving an example of a platform, um, a platform that really went wrong, um, and then an example of a platform that uh, went a little bit better. Uh, and I hope that from that, we'll be able to kind of back ourselves into a definition. So I had someone come to me. You know, before I really started consulting, I, I offered this kind of uh, have lunch with Squirrel, talk to me, uh, tell me about your startup, and um, uh, I'll tell you what I think. And this was great practice, and I learned a lot. Somebody came to me and he said, I have a secret stealth startup. You know, and he kind of looked around the coffee shop we were in, made sure no one was looking, and he pulled his phone out of his pocket, very surreptitious. I felt like I was in a spy movie. And he pulled it out and he showed it to me and he said, I've invented something that every app in the world can use. It's so fantastic. No one's thought of it. It's just such a wonderful, invent incredible invention. And then he showed me cut and paste. And he could cut some text from one app, and he could move it to another app. And I said, I hate to tell you, that's already in both Android and iOS. Cut and paste has been invented. And he said, no, no, my cut and paste is so much better. It does this and does that and does the other thing. I said, Great. And how many people are paying you for this? And he said, well, nobody, but it's going to be wonderful. And that's when I knew he had built uh, exactly the wrong kind of platform because he had built something that would be really useful to lots and lots of people. The problem is he hadn't noticed that nobody would pay him for it because it already existed. So I, I kind of broke this to him as gently as I could, which was not very gently. 
and uh, he was pretty resistant and seemed to think he had really invented something amazing. I did talk to him a couple years later, and he said, you know, Squirrel, you were right. This idea of uh, having cut and paste was really good, um, but I needed to find a specific application. And I can't remember what it was anymore. It's been so many years, but he... Um, he found some situation in which people really wanted some specific kind of cut and paste. They wanted to get data from A into B, um, but it was more sophisticated. I, it may have been images. It might have been something else. I, I think it might have even been, even been police officers or something like that. It was some specialist group who, who wanted something. And their solving their problem uh, was really valuable. And his startup was doing well. But the original idea, let's build cut and paste, although it was a very good abstract notion, uh, it wasn't specific to any users and therefore wasn't useful to them. Um, let me contrast that with something that wasn't a platform, but turned out to be tremendously successful. Uh, and this was a trading platform, and that's what they called it, although it wasn't a platform. It was a trading mechanism. Uh, it was a trading piece of software for particular commodities. And um, I'll obscure it a little bit. Um, uh, let's say it was copper. Uh, so uh, they wanted to trade uh, copper and all kinds of different uh, parts of the world and how many long tons you have of this and what quality of the ore is of that and stuff. I certainly don't understand about copper. And they had the most specialized Excel spreadsheet you've ever seen. This thing had um, bits hanging off it in all different directions to do specialist um, analyses and bits of C code and bits of other things and machine learning and you don't know what. And it was all sitting inside this incredible spreadsheet. Um, and they said, oh, this is our incredible trading platform. And I said, you don't have a platform at all. What you have is something extremely specialized that can really only work for copper. And they said, oh, yeah, we know that. And boy, are we making a ton of money from it. I said, this sounds very successful. Just stop calling it a platform. Um, and what they then did is they moved into other commodities. So, um, and again, uh, uh, I'll obscure the details, but they moved from uh, copper into nickel and platinum and, and other stuff that you would want to trade. And they made tons of money from that as well, uh, which was a very successful thing. But they had to undo and unpick and take apart lots of pieces of this platform that they had built because they hadn't built it in any generic way at all. They hadn't made it something that everybody could use. So um, anonymous uh, LinkedIn user, sorry, I can't always tell who you are. Um, you don't have to tell me who you are, I don't mind. Um, but uh, the person who said, what's the definition of a platform? Uh, well, I would say that it's uh, something that provides a generic uh, uh, purpose, a generic um, uh, set of tools that anybody can use uh, for general, what we might call general purpose computing. Um, so uh, uh, one thing that people talk about is uh, say an iPad, is something that you can just use for the kind of limited things that are on the iPad. If you wanted to use the iPad to, to do something that it's not designed for, like, um, I don't know, if you wanted to use it to uh, run a nuclear plant, you probably could find some very complicated way to get data to come out of your iPad and to get some kind of programming on the iPad that would then run the control rods and some. It's just not designed for that, right? It's not for the general purpose of computing anything you might feel like. Is for the purpose of looking at your email and watching a video and stuff like that. So it's not a platform. It's not something that is general purpose. I would say a platform is uh, for general purpose computing, maybe in a domain. So if that trading platform had really been a true platform, then maybe you'd be able to trade any commodity on it um, or uh, connect to any commodity exchange. And I think they were headed to that, um, but they hadn't built it to start. And that's my key message is that if you're starting to build a platform and you have no users, you are in danger. You are in, uh, you know, you're headed for the cliff. You're about like halfway over. You better uh, do a wily e. coyote and try to jump out and run in midair because uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, LinkedIn user, I hope that that's a helpful definition for you. Um, I'm going to take a quick, feel free to ask more. Uh, I'd love to, to expand more and, and talk more about it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tim says he thinks he has one. Uh, my, Michael says a uh, platform is a unified UI and marketing. So I would disagree pretty strongly with Michael about that. I would say you could have a unified UI and very clear marketing, and it's not general purpose at all. So that's not what I mean by a platform, but maybe Michael knows more than me. He's a very clever person uh, with a, uh, a huge organization beneath him. Um, he says further, from the builder's perspective, it's a set of services, a UI, and patterns between those services. So it seems useful. Yeah, that's useful. But what I mean by a platform is this, um, uh, you've built some piece of software that 
probably your marketing department is telling everybody is infinitely configurable. Oh, it'll do anything. Don't worry. And your salespeople go off and sell it. Oh, yes. Uh, wash your socks. Sounds great. We can also wash uh, other pieces of laundry that you might have uh, in our um, amazing super duper piece of software. Um, great examples of this, by the way, are, um, well, the signal examples. I'm not sure they're great examples. Um, things like SAP, um, uh, S for Samuel, A for Apple, P for Patrick, um, uh, 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 enterprise resource planning piece of software um, that pretty much does anything a manufacturing business might ever want to do. I, I think it will probably send email. I think it probably really will wash your socks. Like if you wanted to manage the laundry because you have to take care of the uniforms of your workers who are in the, the factory making whatever you make, I bet it will run the laundry. I bet there's a laundry plugin for um, uh, 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 for SAP. It does everything that you might possibly want. Um, and it really does. And it is actually a platform and loads and loads of factories run on SAP and, and lots of people run their other parts of their companies like they were factories. It doesn't work out so well. They try to make it fit the model. Um, so Michael, I disagree with you. I don't think that's a platform, but maybe you can debate with me and I'd, I'd love to hear a different point of view. Uh, Roger says, didn't we used to call software with more, more than one component a system? Is calling it a platform just semantics? Uh, excellent question, Roger. And uh, I agree with you that the, this word has become less valuable. That's one reason I seized on it, because uh, I'm going to tell more stories. I have, I have examples of clients who come to me and say, oh, let me tell you about our incredible platform. And they, they remind me of this cut and paste guy. Um, and, and they come along and, and say all these amazing things about uh, their incredible abstract platform. They never tell me what user problem it solves. And when I try to press for an actual user who's actually using it for something, they can't find one. And this is a really dangerous signal. Um, and so, yeah, I think that if you call everything a platform, you're, you're going to wind up with this um, kind of dangerous situation where either you're talking about this very abstract thing, which I think is, is a problematic, or you're just calling your normal piece of software a platform. Um, and I, I've got an example of that from the forum where um, uh, uh, Kanae, uh, who I think is here, um, uh, was was telling us about how his um, uh, company was building. And I, I hope I'm saying his name right as well. I'm terrible with pronouncing your name, Kanae. I apologize. Correct me if I've got it wrong. Um, but uh, uh, he was telling me about how, how his platform uh, is really great. It's uh, working well for the customers and they build it incrementally for each customer. I'm going to talk more about that later. So, so Roger, I, I think the word is problematic. And we can see that from, from Michael's definition, which really def differs from mine. Um, uh, we can call things with more than one component a system. Does that really make them a system? I think we could debate this. I'm going to use this notion of um, something that has this generic purpose, that I can use it for pretty much anything. It'll wash your socks. Uh, it'll do everything. SAP is a, a, a good signal example. And if you're aiming for that, I think you're aiming for the wrong thing. That's my thesis today. So I hope that's been helpful on uh, definition. Um, uh, let me give a particular reason why I think um, this overgeneralization is dangerous. Um, and that's because your product needs a narrative. It needs to tell a story. We did a session a few weeks back on um, uh, storytelling for your product. What is it? How do you make sure your product tells a story? How do you use stories? How do you give a narrative to other people in the organization so they actually understand what you're talking about? How do you get your tech team to give you a meaningful narrative about what they're doing rather than a bunch of tech gobbledygook? Well, your product has to tell a story as well. And the best kind of story is one that polarizes people. It one, it's one that is opinionated. Um, and let me give you another example. Many of you have probably encountered this. And if you haven't encountered this one, you've encountered something similar. Um, if, if you were all here, I'd ask you to raise your hands if you've ever used something called Jira, J-I-R-A, um, or, or Atlassian. Um, they have a suite of products. They now have Trello and um, Confluence and a bunch of other things. And um, they are kind of for automating a lot of the, the work that you might do, especially in knowledge work in, in software development or other uh, areas um, where you want to capture a bunch of knowledge, um, tickets for your customer service people to work on, um, other things like that. Well, the thing I find whenever I go to Atlassian, which definitely is trying to be a platform, is that, that when I first sign on to it, and I do this a lot because I do due diligence. So I'm coming into a company I don't know, and I'm doing a health check on them, and they give me access to their Atlassian system. And so I do this over and over again. I see this a lot. And, and when I come in, the very first thing Atlassian does is say, Squirrel, would you like to sign up for this? Would you be interested in looking at that? Tell us more about your interests here. Which team do you work on? What's your title? What do you do here? There's all this configuration and change and update and so on. I just want to get to the tickets. 
I just want to go look at the pieces that I, I'm interested in. I don't care about those things. It's got tons of flexibility. There's tons of stuff it can do for people who are not me. And I know exactly what I want to do, which is to go look at various particular areas of the uh, uh, of the system and and analyze the technology team that I'm that I'm doing a health check on. And a lot of your users are like this. They will say to you, and they convince themselves this is true. They will say to you, we want flexibility. We want a piece of software that can do this and do that and do the other thing. And when we think up this and when we go into China, it should handle that. And we've got to do right to left languages because we're going to be in Israel soon. And we need one of those and we need to be able to configure this. And uh, by the way, the people in Singapore do everything on Thursdays. Uh, they, they need. They claim that they need this huge amount of customization and customizability, especially businesses. If you do B two B, will do this to you all the time. And the actual fact is not that, that, that they don't use those. <laughs> that they do not find value in that. Even however much they swear up and down, swear blind that they need it, um, because they have this. When they actually get the software, they have this kind of Atlassian response that I'm describing, where they go and look at it and say, "I just want to do this. How can I just do this one thing?" So the, the best pieces of software that I've seen that really solve this problem well don't feel like a platform. They don't feel like this generic thing that could do anything that's general purpose. They feel like somebody has actually made the decisions ahead of time. And you could modify them if you need to. But for most people, it already knows what it's going to do. And it has decided for you that this is the way it should work. Um, a, a good example of that for, uh, for my usage is uh, Stripe. So I use Stripe to take payments. You can go on my website and buy consulting services and things from me uh, and an ebook and other stuff uh, using Stripe. And um, Stripe didn't give me this kind of Atlassian experience. It didn't say, well, you know, configure this and update that and do the other thing. It said, Squirrel, you probably want to sell some things. <laughs> Which things would you like to sell? Would you like to tell us? Uh, here's the first product you can enter um, with the name of the product. And then over here, you can put how much it costs. And then here's the bit you can put on your website so people can buy the product. And that worked great. I've since learned about other things it can do and things it doesn't do so well, like uh, value-added tax and stuff that doesn't do for me. But um, uh, the good news is that when I started using Stripe, it made a bunch of decisions for me. And that made my life tremendously much easier. That It, uh, it was opinionated about what I wanted. So um, th that's the first thing I'll advocate to you is that if you're building a platform, find out who are some actual users and build something that works for them out of the box. Have an opinion about how it should work. And that means you're going to polarize and drive away some people, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but I have a couple of comments here, which I want to pick up. Roger says, I had a client recently that had over 100 applications. And they claimed to be moving to just six platforms. It seems they were just getting clearer about what their business did and therefore what their business really needed to support it, which sounds like a very useful analysis, Roger. I can't argue with you there. Um, it, it may be that they were consolidating their applications. Um, but I very much doubt that they were building a platform. Maybe they were using somebody else's. So one of those applications might have been Atlassian. Um, uh, that would make sense. Um, one another one might have been SAP. I don't know. But uh, uh, if you're building, if you're doing the work, um, the, the odds are that at least at the beginning, you should not be building a platform. So if they were building it themselves, I hope they were not trying to build their own platform, um, uh, at least from scratch. Uh, Elnar says, uh, we're thinking of taking our tech and turning it into a platform that others can leverage. Uh, reason is to speed up finding new applications uh, for our tech through external product managers. Is it wrong? Well, Elnar, I know you very well, of course, and I know your, um, uh, your business well. Um, and I knew you were going to ask this question because you told me you were going to. Um, it, it strikes me that um, you already are fairly opinionated, which is very helpful. Um, and the, the danger for you is that you might lose that opinion, opinionation. I don't know if that's a word, the opinionatedness, maybe that's the right word, um, that, that you would try to let everyone use your software. And Elnar has some very clever software. If, if you want me to talk about it, I will. Elnar does, uh, does some amazing um, analysis of, of human reactions. Um, but uh, if you were to say, look, you can use this for anything. It'll wash your socks. It'll analyze any uh, reaction. It'll do anything at all. Um, I think you're going to lose some of the special sauce that your product has. And especially when you're doing something so revolutionary, um, you know, Elnar's work is, is you know, close to self-driving cars and flying to Mars. It's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, people don't know what they want to do with it yet. They need an expert to guide them. And so that's precisely the time and the circumstance and the situation in which being more opinionated, not less, would be really helpful. 
So my basic advice to you, Eleanor, is um, by all means, try to broaden your base. Try to get to more people who can buy your software. That sounds great. More people should be using it. It's awesome. But um, be opinionated as you go to them. If you just say, hey, here it is, have fun, you know, make whatever you feel like, they're going to be at sea. They will have no idea what to do with it. And I think we've talked about some cases where some, some folks uh, in faraway places uh, tried to do that, and they were really confused. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. I think you're going to need to hold their hands, tell them this is the way to go, and, and feel like Stripe, not Atlassian. Here's the first thing you should do. Uh, let me guide you through that. Let me take you to the right place for you. Uh, that's what I think, and I'm very happy to debate it and uh, to hear more, Elna. Uh, Gene says, uh, oh, Gene, I apologize. You've said it to me before, and I'm terrible, uh, Gene. I've tried to learn to say it right, uh, and I'm probably still murdering it, but uh, glad, glad I have the, the, the right picture there. Um, Michael says, feels like products that incorrectly believe they're a platform are a story for the VCs and business, not the users, and therefore may be a red flag. Well, that's certainly true. Um, and of course, many times I'm doing these health checks for VCs and uh, somebody will say, yeah, we're an amazing platform. Everybody can use us for everything. And the VCs say, oh, that sounds neat. That would be really valuable. And they start getting out their calculators and figuring out how many billions it's going to be worth. And, and the thing that they may not have done quite as thoroughly as I will is to go dig in and say, well, what users is this for? What opinions are you offering? What are you giving them that forces them to go down a certain path and uh, guides them through uh, to, to, to use the software in an effective way rather than just giving them an open book? Um, and uh, so I think absolutely you're right. Incorrectly believing you're a platform or claiming you are when you, when you aren't or when you aren't being an effective one is a very uh, great danger. Eleanor says, there's plenty of interest in our tech, but barrier to entry to integrate and use the tech is quite high. We hope building a platform that simplifies integrating our tech would solve the problem. See, I don't think you're building a platform, at least in my sense. So there, what you're doing is make it easier to integrate with your software that you have. Sounds awesome. I think that, that sounds like a super thing to do. The more we can integrate it, the better. But you're going to need to be opinionated about that. So you might want to tell your customers, integrate with this kind of uh, tool and not that one. Make sure that you use this kind of API and you don't use that one. Um, these are the four key things that you have to do, and everything that integrates with our with our software needs to do these four things. So if you don't do these four things, go away. And that brings me on to my next uh, point, uh, which is uh, another story I can tell you about um, uh, a great um, uh, vodka um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, vodka marketer, uh, who taught me something tremendously useful, even though I don't drink vodka. Uh, so this guy happened to have come up through Belvedere, which is a, uh, a famous vodka brand, apparently. I don't know anything about vodka. And uh, he turned out to be the chairman of the board of the e-commerce company I was in, which was selling to actually a similar demographic, which is why he got there, I think. And um, he sat me down one day and he said, Squirrel, you really need to understand marketing. And I said, I'm a CTO. Why do I need to understand marketing? And he turned out he was absolutely right. And it was really, really valuable. And he said, Squirrel, I just want to tell you this story about how we made sure people didn't buy our product. I said, didn't buy your product? What are you talking about? Uh, what, why would you want people not to buy more vodka? Wasn't that what you were doing? He said, no, no, no. We wanted to turn people off to our vodka and make sure that they didn't buy it. I said, why would you set out to do that? He said, because it made the other people who really wanted to buy our vodka really love the vodka. We wanted to polarize people. We wanted them to either say, this is not the stuff for me. And they've been going very high end. So this was um, uh, you know, very wealthy people, Rolls Royces and, and lawns for days. And, uh, you know, they play uh, uh, play polo with their uh, uh, family horses, that kind of thing. But, so very high end people, uh, apparently, are the, the people that they were targeting. And so what they wanted was for other people who were not in this particular demographic, to say, this isn't for me, you know, I, I drive a Ford, I don't drive a Rolls Royce, um, you know, I, I play football, I don't play um, uh, uh, polo. Um, so uh, this vodka must not be for me. And he wanted that result because what he wanted to do was to capture his target market very tightly and to make sure they thought of this vodka as just for them. Of course, one great thing about vodka, which um, I, again, I know by reputation only, uh, is that all vodka is, is chemically identical. So there is actually no difference among any different types of vodka. The only thing that matters is what's printed on the bottle, right? That's the only difference to what's, what's inside is chemically the same. Um, but it sends a big signal which vodka you order when you go to the bar or, I don't know, the private club or whatever it is, um, uh, is, is an important piece of signaling. And that was what he wanted to capture. He wanted to make sure that the people who were the types of people who bought his vodka really were attached to it and found it very valuable and thought that was the right thing for him, for them. And other people were driven away 
Now, I tell you this story because uh, I claim that if you build a platform, you're saying, hey, everyone, we're, we're for everyone. Uh, you know, doesn't matter what uh, uh, group you're in, doesn't matter what you want your software to do, doesn't matter if you're large or small, what part of the world you're in, platform, open open doors, everybody come and, and, and uh, do what you want. And I think that's very dangerous. Um, th there are some folks who can pull it off, right? Um, but uh, very few brands, if you look around in the marketing world, very few have this kind of uh, very open uh, point of view. Most of them are much closer to Belvedere and the story that I'm telling you where they, they want to exclude people. They want to say, these are the ones that we're for, and these are the ones that we're not. And then we're going to focus our efforts and our product and our value for those people, which is why opinionate, opinionation, I think I'm just going to invent that word, opinionation is so valuable um, uh, for, for them to be opinionated about their marketing, but also for us to be opinionated about what does our software do? What are the defaults? How is it configured? In Onar's case, what are the four key things that every product that integrates with us must have? And I think if you have that kind of opinion, you'll be seen as the expert in, in your area. People who match your profile, who are your ideal buyers, will show up and buy your software, and they will be much more likely to stick with it, to advocate it, to tell their friends. It will be uh, very much stickier for them. Uh, and other people will go away, and you want them to go away. Um, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I, I thought of one. Um, I, I have a, a client for whom I did a strategy workshop. And, and these folks had built something in the uh, financial space, uh, which was appealing to pretty much, they were trying to appeal to everyone. And um, their sales uh, approach was pretty much to say, uh, do you have money? Okay, great. We will sell you this and we'll make sure it works for you. And so they had lots of developers building all kinds of customizations on top of their platform so that everyone could do everything. They were servicing every different type of customer. The thing we concluded was you really need to fire some of these customers. You have not driven enough away. You have not been opinionated enough. And the, reason, the difficulty was it was diluting their entire focus. So um, I think the danger here is if you're not opinionated enough, you won't drive away the right people, and you'll try to build something that does everything for everyone. And you almost certainly don't have the resources to do that. If you think you do, put it in the comments. I would love to hear from somebody who thinks they do. That would be fascinating. Uh, Janae says, uh, also, I think platform is used mostly for marketing purposes, such as the use of organic food. <laughs> it indicates every other food is inorganic, which is not true. Okay, well, I'm not going to touch the um, organic, inorganic debate. I, uh, I have known organic farmers in my life. I will just say that. Um, and uh, uh, that's an interesting, uh, 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 different marketing position. But I think Janae is exactly right that um, uh, a, a, uh, the marketing folks in your organization may say, we want to sell this as a platform. We want to tell everyone to come in. We want a big tent. We want everyone to be part of this. Um, they're making a mistake if they do that. Um, whether they use the word platform or not, I'm going to leave that to their specialty. Maybe that's the right thing to do in your market. Um, but I would not build one that matches whatever they're promising if they do that. And I suspect that they should be more Belvedere uh, and less, I don't know, McDonald's um, uh, in, in terms of their uh, openness to everyone. So very good point. Praveen says, uh, is this how, like how the spreadsheet was the killer app that made generalized PCs valuable? So your software needs a killer purpose to avoid being a platform. Well, I don't think I'd say it's to avoid it, actually. You make a really good point there, Praveen, that um, uh, in the very early days of computers, Praveen's right, um, there, there, of course, were no spreadsheets. There was the notion of actually taking a sheet of paper and spreading it out and then writing lots of stuff on it. But the, the idea of having it on a computer was very, very new. Um, and that was an extremely generic purpose, right? We do things with spreadsheets that the inventors of spreadsheets never intended. Um, people keep their calendars on them and keep uh, task lists and um, uh, people can play games. I think there's a, there's a flight simulator that can run in Microsoft Excel. You know, there's all kinds of crazy things. So um, uh, the, the fact is that uh, there's uh, something like Excel is really a platform. It is completely generic, a programming language is, right? So Python or, or Ruby or, or C or something like that. That would be a platform. It really is open to any use. Um, but the challenge is you're going to find those very rarely, and um, they're very difficult to support. Um, Microsoft, of course, runs a huge division who does nothing but um, fix Excel. Uh, do you have that kind of resource for a relatively new product, which is, I think, what many of, of, of you are, are building? So. Um, Praveen, I wouldn't say necessarily that your software needs a killer purpose to avoid being a platform. If it has a um, this sort of uh, uh, killer notion that it can it can be the thing that it really solves problems for everybody, you're really onto something valuable. You know, Bill Gates did pretty well out of Excel, 
but the problem and and um, you know Lotus Notes and others did very well before them. But the the problem is that um, uh, you're very unlikely to find such a thing. You, you'd be very very lucky to happen upon it and then be able to support it. Because of course we all know Excel, but we don't know uh, some of the early versions. And I've managed to forget the name. You'll remind me, Praveen. That um, was it. Lotus Notes, or was it something else? There was VisiCalc. That's the one I couldn't remember. Um, uh, VisiCalc uh, is not around um, because uh, I suspect they, they they got killed by Excel, who could um, uh, by Microsoft, who could support uh, a much broader customer base. They they couldn't drive enough and uh, drive away enough people. So I hope that's helpful, Praveen. I'm not sure I was understanding your question. Ask again if you want to. Uh, Martin, who I know is a great product manager, he says, uh, the, the less opinionated you are, the more you drive your customers into the arms of Capgemini, et cetera. Exactly. <laughs> we want to keep them far away from Capgemini. <laughs> Sapient, stay far away. Um, uh, no, no, uh, it's not Arthur Anderson anymore. Um, uh, Accenture. Um, uh, also, the, the more you allow your salespeople to claim to solve all problems, exactly. And um, uh, certainly, I can tell you many war stories of uh, uh, health checks and, and companies I've consulted for where um, the salespeople had way oversold. I was telling you about one example just a moment ago. All right, great comments. Please keep them coming. Very interested in, in comments and thoughts uh, from you guys. Uh, let's see. So I've got one more example, and this one came up on the forum. And, and this is kind of a different direction. Um, so, uh, 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 this person who I'm not sure he's here, so I, 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 I won't say his name. Uh, he says in a previous role, we built a platform, a layer of abstraction around AWS native deployment tooling. Uh, the aim was, uh, to give developer convenience and built-in security, but it was a disaster. And he goes on to detail how, um, uh, they couldn't actually keep up. Uh, the demands were too high. There were too many different things that uh, developers needed. They were trying to build this all in-house. And then AWS showed up and built a version of it, and they couldn't actually use it because they'd invested so much in this uh, non-opinionated, very generic uh, tool that they were using in-house. Um, so I thought that was just a great story of not being opinionated enough and uh, having it kill you. So do not uh, go down this path. Uh, avoid that. That's my main message for today. Adina says, maybe platform is a dream idea in a company where regulations and licensing is more important than having a profit. Oh, and Jess says he's here. Great. Thanks. Hope you don't mind. I told the story. Um, uh, regulations and licensing is more important than having a profit. Um, is there a company in which regulations and licensing is more important than a profit? I think there are companies that fool themselves into thinking that, but they go out of business pretty quickly. So um, they might claim that having a platform would be helpful to them, and they're um, they're benighted, they're they're misled, they're in trouble. So uh, my main message to you today is: uh, don't be benighted, <laughs> don't be uh, don't be trapped in this way. Um, so I think I've managed to zip through all my stories because you guys really prompted me with uh, excellent questions. I'm going to stop and, and uh, have a sip of water here. I've been going so so much I haven't done that. Um, ask me any questions that you have. Where haven't I covered enough? Uh, you know, Janae, have I uh, covered your thoughts uh, on, on the um, type of platform that you're building? Jez, what did you think of your story? How does it fit into the model? I don't think Michael agrees with me yet, um, for sure. I think he thinks something different. And I don't know if I've helped Elnar. So um, any of you who would like to comment, uh, I'd love to hear from you and answer more questions, or I can just come to an end. So you tell me, I'll give you, I'll take a little sip of water. You tell me what uh, what I should talk about next. For those of you in faraway countries, it's extremely hot in England today. So um, if I uh, visibly perspire, um, that's why, that's why I'm drinking so much water. Elnar says, uh, where do you draw the line between being opinionated to better direct users, but not too opinionated to enable completely new use cases to be born through the use of the platform? That is a very tricky one. Um, I would say, actually, uh, I would err completely on the side of being opinionated. Opinionation is my is my new word. I, sh I should use that in the, in the promotion here. Um, and the reason I say that is that users are extremely creative in being able to use your tool in ways that it was never designed to be used. And, and I've seen that over and over and over again. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Um, and none is coming to mind right this moment. But but over and over again, um, there are people who, who uh, use the software. Oh, I know a perfect example. Actually, this is a great story if people don't know this one. Um, you might remember a tool called Flickr, which came around sort of before Instagram. Uh, it was a way of sharing your photos. Um, and I, I think people still use it. I think it's still up. And um, what people usually don't know about Flickr is that it started as an online game. 
So uh, if you join Flickr, apparently, as a uh, uh, as a developer, the first thing they have to show you is all the different uh, pieces of code, all the different classes and so on that are named after monsters. You know, there's the orc and there's the uh, something else, the, the, the skeleton and something else. And they're all named after the monsters that were in the game. Because what happened was that people were playing the game and it was kind of an okay game. But the, the game had a particular way of sharing pictures, I think maybe of your character, I'm not sure, but it had some kind of picture interface, which people found really interesting. And so instead of uploading pictures of their character, they uploaded pictures of their house or their cat or whatever and started sharing it. It was a game, right? So if people wanted to look at the pictures, they had to go like sign into the game and get assigned a number of hit points or something uh, to, to, to join it. Uh, so it was this um, co complete misuse of the product. But the Flickr people were intelligent enough to say, you know, maybe this game isn't the thing we should go with. They seem to like the pictures. So let's make it a picture platform. And that survives in the code to this day. So Elnar, my, my advice would be um, trust your users a bit more and listen to them. And I know you do a lot of that. So I, I encourage you to continue um, and, and let them misuse your platform. I think if they were misusing it and, and you paid attention to it the way the Flickr folks did, you would still be discovering those new use cases that would be born. Um, because when someone wants to use something, they, they are usually pretty creative in doing so. That's my experience. Hope that's helpful. Praveen says, uh, I meant that the PC when it came out was like a platform because it was general purpose and people didn't know what to do with it. Well, that's true. I certainly remember that. I, I bought one. My parents bought one for me and brought it home and, and you know, sat around and looked at it for a while working out how, how, what it was for. Um, spreadsheet came out and it gave a, a purpose and made it useful to people. That is certainly true. Um, you're, you're, so it is helpful if you have a focus for whatever your platform might be and you build it up from there. So it's almost like assembling Lego bricks, right? So you're gonna take a piece over here and you don't know what the next brick is gonna be until you get it and you stick it on and you say, oh, this is starting to look like. Uh, so uh, that kind of way of making a sculpture, you know, carve away the things that, that don't look like a horse uh, until you have a horse. Okay, uh, Michael says, given your definition, I agree with the concern over jumping to a platform naively and the fact that it can be a trap. Just some like my company say platform when they mean SaaS UI, <laughs> okay. Well, Michael, we're working together, so um, maybe we should talk about uh, repurposing or, or shifting that marketing, because I think that's very confusing and um, probably harmful. I, I suspect that that's going to confuse people and give them the wrong impression that, uh, you know, come to Michael's company and uh, it'll wash your socks. That, that's the danger that I see there. Um, uh, talk to me more about that here or elsewhere if you want to. Roger says, uh, would you expect to see something that can justifiably be called a platform only in large or very large companies? E.g., I would expect Vodafone to have a billing platform, but I wouldn't expect an SME to need a platform to bill its customers. Sure. And the SME might buy billing from somebody like Stripe or somebody like that, who really is big enough uh, to support a huge number of different use cases. So, yeah, I suspect if somebody's here and, you know, if anybody comes on this live stream or watches it later from Apple or, or Google or, or um, uh, I don't know, Ford or General Motors or somebody like that, um, and, and you have thousands and thousands of developers and you can really support a platform and you start to build one, you start by thinking, gosh, I'm going to build a platform and I'm going to start with a generic case. I'd be really interested in talking to somebody like that because uh, I've not encountered it. And I suspect that's not how they do it. I suspect that they get to the platform by building a bunch of really special cases, and then they assemble them and generalize them and put them together into something they can then sell to others in the way you say uh, Vodafone might have a billing platform for dealing with all of us who have Vodafone phones and therefore buy stuff with them. Um, but I suspect they started by supporting some specific use cases and then put it together. I don't know. That would be an interesting uh, interesting case. I, I definitely agree with you. Anything that's um, even remotely smaller, you don't have to get much smaller before this doesn't make any sense at all, um, it, it would, would not want to start by uh, saying, we're going to build a platform that will deal with everything for everyone all, all at once. Uh, Michael Smith loves the thought of being opinionated and, and uh, nearly polarizing the users. No, no, Michael, you didn't understand actually polarizing the users. So this Belvedere guy, he, he every day he went into work and he thought, how can I piss off more people and make them not you not drink Belvedere? That was his thought. And of course, he also wanted to make the people who loved Belvedere love it even more. But the way he got to that was by saying, how can I exclude people? How can I get people not to buy it? How can I make sure that they are annoyed by this part, that this part of the population is annoyed and this part of the population loves it? So it's not nearly um, polarizing them. It's actually polarizing them. Uh, hope that cor correction helps you and provokes you even more. Adina says, which people and which type of people should be part of the platform team? As a note, I did not want to be part of it, 
as I don't agree with one solution process fits all teams. A team is made by people who put a brick or mortar in the same wall, very simplistic. Um, so uh, which people should be part of the platform team? I don't think you need a platform team. That's the argument I'm making here. Um, you may have a very specific situation I'm not understanding, so feel free to ask. But um, uh, I, don't, I don't think you need something called the platform team. Um, there's often uh, in a development organization, a group who um, uh, do deal with something that is a platform. AWS would be an example of that. So there might be system administrators who deal with your um, integration with Amazon Web Services where your servers might be. Um, and so they're the platform team in the sense they work with somebody else's platform. But if you're building one, I suspect, Adina, I, I think I know what size of organization you're in, and I would be astonished if a platform was a good idea for you. So maybe I'm misunderstanding. Roger says, right, the platform emerges by consolidating multiple more specialized applications. Great. Okay. I don't know if you've done that, Roger. I'd love to hear from you if you, if you have. Tell me here or um, maybe on the forum later um, that uh, I, I'd be interested in thinking more about uh, how big organizations do that. But but I suspect that that you you are right, that that's what they do. Uh, it sounds like you might know. Uh, Adina says, with different role, but unified product. Um, not quite sure where you're going there, Adina, but uh, happy to help if I can. Look, these are great questions. I think I'm at the bottom of the list. Um, I'm going to take another sip, see if there's more that I can help people with. Um, uh, uh, tell me, where are you stuck? Uh, have, has this been helpful to you? Uh, do you still disagree with me? That would be great. I'd love more disagreement. Also, I have to say, I love the interactivity today. This has been super. Sometimes I've come on and I haven't provoked people enough, so they're not arguing with me. I really like that you're bringing up ideas, commenting, and, and bringing things to me. I really appreciate it. Martin says, Roger, I think you're right at business level, but obviously there is no need to reinvest, reinvent the wheel, uh, re-storage, uh, for example. Certainly, and that's where something like S3, which is a storage solution from Amazon, uh, would, would be silly for, for someone to build, right? That's something where you can buy it, and they have built a platform, and you can store anything you want in S3. The whole point of it is uh, to, to be able to store any type of data and um, just not worry about it. You just stick it somewhere and it's there and available to you and it's in a bucket, which is another very generic term. I'm gonna put this in a bucket. Well, anything can go in a bucket if the bucket's big enough and uh, then I can retrieve it again from the bucket. The problem is that um, Amazon did, I know this, Amazon didn't set out to say, boy, let's build a set of buckets in which anybody and anywhere in the world can store things. They said, we got all these books and, and they all have descriptions of things and they all have pictures of the books and man, it's tough to keep track of those. Let's build a thing and a thing that only does one thing that's opinionated that deals with all the information that you want to store about books. And we'll have that in things, I don't know, what will we call them? We'll call them buckets. And in there, you can store stuff about books. And then they said, oh yeah, maybe we can use that for some other things too. And then they opened it up to the world. So that's when I know the example is like what Roger and I have been talking about where Amazon built their platform with a specific example in mind and then generalized it. And um, I think you're absolutely right, that Brett Martin, that it would be dumb for someone to build, build that. It's good for them to buy it. And it is a platform now. Uh, Michael says, we have a platform team as well, a team we use for shared engineering, things like message queues, logging, et cetera. What do you think of that term? I think that's a perfectly reasonable term. It just means something very different. It's not a product management uh, term. Uh, the engineers are saying, this is the stuff that all us engineers use that's shared, the message queues and the logging and so on. But I very much hope that your platform team is not trying to build its own message queue. Uh, I'd be very worried if they were doing that. I, I was uh, doing a due diligence on someone who had rebuilt DocuSign. I said, people who use our product need to sign documents, so we're going to build our own DocuSign. I said, why on earth would you need to build your own? <laughs> they built it already, so I didn't give them too much of a grief about it. But I said, don't do this again. <laughs> There's no point in building this on uh, yourself. So I'm thinking more in product terms here, so very much in your area, Michael. Um, where, where if you, Michael, were to be saying, yes, and we're building an amazing platform which does message queues, I, I would tell you to run away from the cliff uh, quickly, right? You're, you're headed the wrong way. Turn turn left. Uh, something's going to go wrong. Martin says, uh, maybe platform is actually multi-leveled. Some layers are really new, but others are mature. Guess so. Uh, I think typically you're going to be having mature pieces, which I hope are not in your organization. It's, it's pretty rare that any of us, I think, are going to build a platform. So I'm not quite sure where you're going there, Martin. You could be right. Onar says, we are building a separate platform team with the objective of productizing our tech as a platform. We are also looking at how other product teams can be using and contributing to the platform. See, this is where I'm worried for you, Onar. I think you should phone me. <laughs> we should talk more about this because that seems like a dangerous direction. 
and it could be, and, it, and, and I, uh, I'm just worried about the name. So it, it could be that you're doing this fine. I'd expect that team to have very specific opinionated um, uh, targets for specific customers where they are building a, um, uh, making the tech more um, integratable. I love that when you talked about that earlier, making it more inter integration friendly, but I wouldn't want it to be friendly to all integration to everything. That's where I think you're going to fall in a big abstraction hole, and um, that, that's going to cause you a lot of trouble. That's just my two cents. Um, I'm interested in what you think. Michael says, uh, uh, no worries. We don't have not invented here syndrome. Thank heavens. That's uh, very dangerous. We want to avoid that. Good stuff. Uh, one more drink to see if anybody has more questions. I think we're coming to the end here. And um, so far, I haven't had anybody argue platforms are great. We really should have them. In fact, I've heard um, opinionated software sounds like a good idea. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but I'd love to hear disagreement. Okay, well, I hope none of you are as hot as uh, we are here in England. Um, and if you are, that uh, you go uh, find a paddling pool to jump in and cool off. Um, but it's been fantastic interacting and chatting with all of you. This is the sort of thing we do in the Squirrel Squadron. This is why I get up in the morning. It's why I run it. And, and it's free. I should just make sure that's clear that this is not something I charge for. Uh, I don't do upsells. I'm, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Uh, what I want is for non-tech and tech people to have a discussion and a debate just like we've been having. And uh, I imagine that much of you have, have learned a lot of things. I certainly have uh, new ideas and, and things are, are percolating in my brain. And I invented a new word today, opinionation. So that's what we do in the Squirrel Squadron. Uh, if you're interested uh, then uh, in doing more of this, then come along. Uh, I'm going to put up on the screen, assuming I can type correctly. Uh, I will uh, put up the, uh, the website, squirrelsquadron.com is where you can sign up for more of these. As I say, I'm going to be live in London in uh, uh, just about a month's time, uh, 8th of September, talking about how to say yes to everything, how your, your answer to whatever the request might be from a customer or somebody internal or the CEO could be yes. How, how could you make sure your tech team does everything? Uh, in fact, you can do that, and I will talk more about that. Uh, so that's a live event. Um, we have the forum I've mentioned a few times where we have these discussions, and uh, Janae and Jez were making contributions there. Um, and uh, we have virtual events every week. They're always free. So I'd love to hear from any of you there uh, and uh, really enjoyed having such a, a vigorous back and forth. Let's do more of that. And uh, some of you, I'm sure I will see next week when we talk about the art of the reprimand. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate seeing you and uh, see you again soon. Have a wonderful and I hope not too hot day.